This video is brought to you by the brand new SteelSeries Alias Pro, an all-in-one recording and streaming microphone that not only produces studio quality sound, but also comes with an advanced software suite allowing you studio level control over your sound and setup. It just released last week and you can get a 12% discount on it when you use offer code SKILLUP at checkout. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Lords of the Fallen. The successor to Lords of the Fallen. Yeah, not confusing at all, guys. But then again, we're living in a time where we have literally two Call of Duty Modern Warfare trilogies. So whatever, I guess. Now, this game has gone through hell. It supposedly began production in 2015, targeting a 2017 release date, and was being developed without the involvement of Deck 13, the developers of the original game by the same name. It spent two years in the concept stage before being dropped due to layoffs by the publisher. Then in 2018, it was handed to another studio to start again from scratch. A year later, in 2019, the publisher deemed early tests inadequate, so they dropped that studio and founded Hexworks, a new studio tasked with the sole purpose of developing that cursed Lords of the Fallen sequel. Fast forward to last year, hot off the Elden Ring hype, we got a sick looking announcement trailer that looked nothing like the original. Turns out this isn't a sequel nor a remake, it's a reboot, upholding the same dark fantasy setting of the original, but taking even more cues from the Souls-like genre while bringing some new ideas of its own. Now I find myself feeling rather mixed about Lords of the Fallen. I mean, on the art side, it's fantastic. Uh, we've got some great looking games this year, and this is no exception. It's one of the few releases this year made in Unreal Engine 5, and it uses that to its full advantage, with stunning vistas and diverse environments boasting staggering detail. The ability to shift between the realms of the living and the dead seamlessly is also both a technical marvel and a visual feast. Needless to say, I was consistently wowed by the artistry on display here. However, it is weighed down by poor performance and bugs. On the gameplay side though, uh, I found this game fun overall, but it suffered from a fair few pitfalls. Level design was a real pain point. Uh, between the endless ladders and doors and switching between world states, I would often get completely lost navigating these spaces. The game does not do a great job guiding the player, and while that can sometimes add to that sense of mystery and exploration, it more often feels obtuse, with sparse checkpoints further adding to the tedium. Then there's the combat, which is... it's okay. I mean, while it'll feel familiar to those experienced with the genre, it's unmistakably missing that last bit of animation and audio-visual polish to push it over the line. It is functional though, and despite some camera issues, especially when dealing with multiple targets, I never found it too frustrating. Enemy design is definitely hit or miss though. Uh, I found bosses in particular a little disappointing, with their rather limited movesets, poor telegraphing, and lack of narrative context. All that said, I don't think this is a bad game. It brings some ambitious new ideas to the table, and I did broadly enjoy my time with it. Developing a great Souls-like is surely a monumental task, especially given how high that bar has been raised, and while Hexworks falls short on those expectations, Lords of the Fallen may still be worth checking out, if you can overlook its rather other rough edges. Welcome, Dark Crusader. Set 1,000 years after the original Lords of the Fallen game, we awake within the bowels of Mornstead, a once prosperous land now under threat by the return of their oppressive demon god, Adir. Five beacons of light have kept him at bay for a millennium, but they've since become corrupted by his followers, heralding his return. You are a lamp bearer, protectors of the realm tasked with cleansing the land of demons and sinners alike and restoring the beacons. The story of Lords of the Fallen is... <laughs> To be honest, it's not much. Uh, I think Souls-likes tend to have a reputation for being quite obscure in their storytelling. Characters will reference places and events in history that you may not understand now, but will eventually through further interactions and lore nuggets hidden throughout the world. It's a jigsaw puzzle where individually the pieces don't look like anything, but once put together, you'll be rewarded for your efforts with the final artwork that you can sit back and appreciate. In my over 30 hours of playtime, uh, <laughs> 
I, I really cannot explain to you what has happened other than the fact that I have cleansed some beacons. The characters you meet rarely respond to your actions, the bosses you've cleared, the locations you've been to. Like the main dude who finds you and bestows upon you this grand quest to cleanse the beacons, I was constantly revisiting him after each beacon and boss. Nothing. The same dialogue as when we first met at the start of the game. Some of the characters speak about their faith in us, their god, perhaps even their lack thereof. There are no doubt some interesting stories here. I was especially invested in the story of this husband and wife and their tortured history, which you unveil through these flashbacks out in the world. But the narrative doesn't ever feel like it's going somewhere or building to something. There's a real lack of urgency or even stakes. I mean, you're never really given much insight into who a deer is, or what kind of prosperous life humanity was living before the recent invasion. Lies of P, for example, did an excellent job showing hints of what life was like before the collapse, you know, like what you're fighting for. Just never really got that level of context here, which is a shame because the dialogue that does exist is well written and voice acted. What Lords of the Fallen lacks in the story department though, it makes up for in visual splendor. I mean, you can see the gameplay, this is an undoubtedly stunning video game. This is one of the few games this year to utilize Unreal Engine 5, and it shows. Geometry is rendered in remarkable detail, lighting looks fantastic, especially in those outdoor environments. The art direction is superb too. Each location feels so distinct from one another. A village engulfed in flames, holy refuges and hallowed halls, sun-bleached keeps decorated by scarlet red vegetation. I can perhaps see some criticism being made that it looks too derivative, like it's just aping the Elden Ring or Dark Souls aesthetic. Uh, I, I get that, it doesn't quite have its own visual identity in the same way something like Lies of P does. But what Hexworks has delivered here is undeniably impressive regardless. To compare it to Elden Ring would be a high compliment. In fact, I dare say Mornstead even surpasses the beauty of the lands between at times, which is no small feat. This comes at a cost though, and that cost? Before performance. Now, I'm not gonna lie, it was already pretty sus when I first booted up the game and saw the resolution scaling defaulted to 50%, but I cranked up that bad boy and pushed on. I myself didn't have too many issues playing on an RTX 3090 Ti at 2K resolution. At max settings, the game was running at 60 FPS most of the time, though it did drop below that pretty regularly alongside stuttering, particularly during later parts of the game. I then tested this out on my laptop with an RTX 3060 60, still above the recommended spec requirements, mind you, and at the same max settings, 2K resolution, I'm getting 30 FPS, with the game regularly dropping as low as 20. Only way to get this running at a consistent 60 FPS on this laptop was at low settings, but even then, I was dropping to about 50. Console is apparently even worse, with blurry visuals, likely due to the resolution scaling, more stutters and lower frames, so yeah, your results may vary substantially. You kind of need to be on some much higher end hardware for this to run consistently, and you should definitely consult console reviews if you're looking to try it there. I also encountered a number of bugs throughout my playtime. I counted two hard crashes, sometimes menus or dialogue would bug out and not respond, so I'd have to reopen them. One time I was trying on some helmet and they'd take forever to load. Multiple times my character would just get stuck and unable to move. A really strange one I found today is that some of my shortcuts have just been closed up. Uh, not sure if this is due to an update or something, but very odd indeed. Look, I'm pretty lenient when it comes to this stuff. Most of it didn't really impact my enjoyment of the game, but it's worth keeping in mind that this certainly isn't an uncompromised experience. This isn't the only version of Mornstead you'll be exploring though, for there exists two parallel realms that the lamp bearer can shift between. Axiom, the realm of the living, and Umbral, the realm of the dead. Shining the lamp will reveal the Umbral layer, and with the press of a button, or upon death, you'll be completely transported there. The world morphs in front of your eyes from a vibrant land bursting with life to a haunting hellscape built upon the bones of giants. I was constantly floored at the spectacle of this realm and the technical wizardry required to pull this off. Just remarkable. 
Let's talk about the gameplay implications of this though. So shining your lamp doesn't just allow you to see the umbral realm, but also navigate it. If there's a poison lake ahead, but none in the umbral realm, you can hold out your lamp and walk freely through. It'll also reveal the enemies lurking in that realm, and if they touch you, you'll be brought there too. The reason you don't want to just shift completely to the umbral realm at all times is twofold. Number one, this place acts as your second life. If you die in the realm of the living, you'll resurrect here with a shot at returning by finding these little podiums. If you die here though, it's game over. Number two, the longer you spend in the umbral realm, the more dangerous it becomes. There's these tormented souls that'll spawn out of nowhere. They're weak alone, but many more will spawn as you linger and eventually overwhelm you. Stick around long enough and this grim reaper guy will hunt you down to ruin your day. So you're incentivized to stay in the realm of the living as much as possible. The problem is that you aren't really given a choice. While you can navigate the umbral realm by simply shining the lamp, you can't actually interact with it. So if there's a ladder that you need to climb or a platform that you need to pull, you'll be forced to sacrifice that second life to do so. This, to be honest, felt a little cumbersome to me, especially given you're often only using it to solve one small traversal challenge and then you want to get back. I think the devs knew this too, because the podiums to send you back are sort of just haphazardly dotted around, but that feels like an inelegant solution to the problem. I understand this as a punishment for dying and that would have been fine, maybe your lamp gets broken or something, but it kind of stifles puzzle design. Had you been able to freely traverse between these worlds, it could have resulted in some more involved puzzle solving. Because yeah, the puzzles you're using this mechanic for are very, very simple. At its most basic, you'll use it to walk across a gap or through a door. At its most complex, you'll pull a couple platforms together. I can't help but feel there could have been more done with this system if the implementation of the realm shifting was a little more flexible. But the real problem with traversal is level design. It's hard to put into words because good level design is something you almost don't notice. Like in hindsight, I don't think I gave enough credit to Lies of P's level design, which managed to keep you moving forward, offering generous shortcuts and visual cues that meant I rarely ever got lost in the game. I got lost many, many times in Lords of the Fallen. I thought maybe it's just me being oblivious, but others I've spoken to have also had a problem with this. It's something to do with the lack of visual aids. Like you just come across doors upon doors. Some of them are shortcuts, but some require specific keys. Uh, once you've opened them all, it's hard to decipher which one of those doors is the way forward. There is also no map. Uh, you only have these journal entries to guide you, which are sort of sketches that point you towards specific landmarks. I don't mind this to be honest, uh, I'm always an advocate for moving away from mini maps and waypoint markers, but when everywhere within a zone looks so samey, uh, this doesn't do quite enough to alleviate the confusion. It's worse in the umbral realm which you're forced to go to, where much of these landmarks are now obscured by all the skeletal structures. The white ghouls you use to pull across platforms and unlock doors kind of blend in with all the other pale enemies and architecture. The checkpoints are also very, very stingy. How this works is that each zone has one major checkpoint that you're free to use, but for the rest of the level, you'll need to plant your own checkpoints at these garden beds. These are very rare to find out in the open world, so there's basically only two ways to get these seeds. One of them is bosses, but you'll likely use that seed to plant at the boss once you've defeated them. So the only other option is buying them. Now, they're not too expensive, but in a game where so much is already competing for your currency, they're costly enough that it's uh, rather annoying to manage. Each seed is the same cost of like a weapon upgrade or half of a level up. So yeah, you never have many of these on you unless you've farmed and stocked up on them. Something that was very frustrating and happened often is getting through a large chunk of a level, arriving at a boss, only to realize you don't have a seed to plant. So you've either got to die or run back to farm up some more currency to buy one. Doubly annoying is that you can only have one seed active at a time. So if you're working on a boss but want to go somewhere else to explore or something, well, you're going to have to overwrite that checkpoint. 
really stifles exploration, to be honest. It's a strange mechanic that never really justifies its existence. Credit where it's due, though, the fact that these levels exist in the way they do is admittedly impressive. The game is not split up by portals or loading screens. This is a linear game, more or less, but the zones are interconnected into one big seamless world. When I first saw the five beacons off in the horizon, I never imagined that I'd actually be getting to those places on foot. But yeah, you can absolutely run from those very sewers you started in, to the hub area, to the upper castle keeps, without hitting a single loading screen. It takes some real tact to pull that off at this scale, and I was always blown away when one area would organically link to one that I had explored tens of hours ago. Ultimately though, this isn't enough to save the game's level design woes or new numerous technical issues. That sense of awe is short-lived, later making way for frustration, a sentiment that, at times, also extends to the game's combat. So as I said in the intro, the combat in Lords of the Fallen is just okay. I wouldn't call it bad, but it isn't great either. I mean, it's a Souls-like, it'll feel immediately familiar to you if you're into this genre, but with a few notable exceptions. First of all, on keyboard and mouse, the controls are really overloaded. I mean, it feels like you've got to use almost every key on the keyboard. There's like four different functions bound to the lantern, all on separate keys. Uh, you might have multiple spells slotted that are also bound to different keys. It's a bit of a mess, to be honest. Inversely though, on controller, which is my favourite way to play these games, I dare say these are some of the best controls for a Souls-like. I mean, for goodness sakes, you can click the left stick to sprint. None of this claw grip while you run away from the boss trying to swap to your flasks. Holding the left trigger converts your attack inputs into the lamps or immediately draws your ranged weapon. And yeah, there is an emphasis on ranged combat in this game. It's the reason each of the classes all have access to some sort of ranged option. And yeah, I mean, it works. Where in most games your arrows or throwables would be consumables, here you simply equip the type that you want and they expend a universal ammo resource that you can restore, similar to mana. There's multiple types of arrows, spears, throwing knives, everything. There's loads of options. There's also of course plenty of spells that you can use as well, but I wasn't able to experiment with this much as I went for more of a dual wielding bleed focused build. I've seen a lot of people noting that the melee combat seems floaty or weightless. Uh, I don't know that I totally agree but I don't discount those criticisms either. Sound design is a little lacking. In fact, sound design was such an issue during previews that the studio have redone them multiple times before release. In my experience, it still didn't quite get there, particularly when it comes to parries and fatal attacks. I feel like the intrinsic reward for playing such a high risk, high reward sword and board playstyle is often the satisfying twang that comes with each perfect parry followed up by a juicy fatal blow. Here, each block sounds like a gentle knock on a door. Fatal attacks sound like someone just smushing a watermelon with none of the rip and tear that you'd expect. <laughs> Animation and camera issues also hold this back. Many of your attacks thrust you very far forward, often screwing up your positioning, especially during boss fights where a single misstep can end in disaster. Could immediately tell that something was off with the camera. I mean, lock-on cameras are a fickle thing. You don't want it to focus so slow that you can't properly track your target, like Atlas Fallen, but you also don't want it to move too fast. You know, there's a real balance here that most modern Souls likes have nailed down. It's too fast here, straight up. If you're up against against multiple enemies or body parts, your camera snaps between them in an instant, which can be quite dizzying. Especially bad against the bigger bosses. Holy moly, <laughs> really difficult to track attacks when all you can see are their feet. You'll use the lamp in combat as well, but this suffers from similar camera issues. You can rip the soul from an enemy and attack that for big damage, but the camera kind of pans around it as you do so, which can get a little frustrating. Some enemies will be shielded by a wisp in the umbral realm that you have to shine the lamp on to destroy so that you can attack the enemy. And this can also feel quite clunky to deal with during encounters. Speaking of enemies, this game throws a lot of ranged enemies at you. Their projectiles are fast, uh, for the most part you will not be able to side strafe them and will have to burn dodge rolls. Not a big fan to be honest, don't get me wrong, the ranged combat is enough to deal with them, but is this fun? 
Not really, particularly when you're up against multiple melee enemies and there's some ranged dude in the corner taking pot shots at you. There's also a fun little enemy that disguises itself as an item. If you try to pick it up, it kills you instantly. Not a good time. bosses as well. These are a real mixed bag and like the combat, I just kind of feel indifferent about them. Most of them are sort of just juiced up versions of a new enemy type the game wants to introduce you to, but even the major bosses are a bit of a letdown. Something about them not really having much narrative build up, like I really have no idea who these guys are until after you kill them and then you get these little flashbacks. They have really limited move sets too, often only three or so moves to learn and some of those attacks can feel quite cheap in their telegraphing and damage. Overall though, combat felt fine. You know, it felt weighty enough when dual wielding, you had to really commit to attacks and being able to weave between melee and ranged combat with relative ease was a real highlight for me. But the sound design, animation and camera issues definitely left a little to be desired. That said, Hexworks have deployed a patch today that addresses some of these issues. Haven't had a chance to try this out myself, but it's worth calling out and I hope that it resolves some of those problems. Quick note on unlocks. Uh, 30 hours in, I have not unlocked the ability to re-spec my points. Don't know what that's about. Uh, I can speak to the character who does it, but the option is greyed out. She hasn't asked me to get anything, just has the same dialogue as usual. Uh, maybe that's a bug too? I don't know. I leveled the same criticism at Lies of P, and I'm gonna say it again here. This is a genre all about trial and error. Please, for the love of God, let me re-spec early on. I am tired of farming souls to try out new playstyles. From what I can tell, all weapons of the same category share the same moveset as well. So all short swords have the same moveset, all the axes, etc. You can mix it up with two-handing and dual wielding, but I never felt like there was enough here to truly spice up the gameplay. What about the unique boss weapons? I would love to tell you. If I had any. Again, bafflingly, I have not unlocked the ability to cash in these boss drops for their unique weapons. Maybe I've missed something. Obviously, when guides are released into the wild, this will be less of a problem, but yeah, I, I don't know. I get that souls likes are just uh, like this, but to hide such a crucial element is so strange to me. I would have loved to have seen how these boss weapons might have changed things up, but I just didn't have the means to do so. So that's Lords of the Fallen. After clawing its way from the depths of development hell, it's here and it's okay. It's a fun but flawed experience. It's a game with great ambitions and excellent artistic direction, but unfortunately falls short of expectations when it comes to performance, narrative, level design, and combat polish. I recognize this has been quite a scathing review, but I want to clarify that despite all these issues, I did have a decent time with this game. The combat works, the visuals are gorgeous, and the lamp mechanic is interesting to play around despite not reaching its full potential. There's some cool ideas here that can be used as a foundation to build on, and I look forward to seeing what this team might be able to achieve with a sequel, like an actual sequel this time. Important to note that this is one of the few Souls likes that can be played through entirely co-op. I unfortunately didn't get the chance to try this myself as much as I would have liked to, but I imagine this will really enhance your experience, especially if you're worried about different Difficulty. If you're playing solo, you do have the option to summon NPCs to help you out, though I discovered this is only available on a few major bosses and sometimes they can be pretty useless, so don't expect to rely on this. Hexworks have already issued patches that address some of the issues I encountered during my playthrough, but more work is needed to fully iron out all the bugs and issues. Still, if you're a Souls-like enjoyer and are tired of replaying Elden Ring for the seventh time, or you've smashed out Lies of P and looking for the next thing to satiate your glutton for punishment, this may be worth picking up. Though perhaps at a discount, uh, as there's foundational issues here that cannot be resolved with mere patches, and outside of its visual presentation, Lords of the Fallen doesn't quite come close to showcasing the best this subgenre has to offer. Okay, so for the past few weeks, I've been testing out the all-new SteelSeries alias microphone. SteelSeries sent me a pre-release version. I wasn't sure what to expect because microphones are a bit of an art form, but I plugged it in, configured it, and was immediately blown away by not only the sound quality, but the ease of use and how much you can customize everything using SteelSeries' powerful Sonar software suite. 
So this is the Alias. It comes with a weighted stand, but it's also got an adapter for easy mounting on a boom arm. It's got a custom built one inch condenser capsule that's three times the size of standard microphone capsules to flawlessly capture your voice, while a finely tuned cardioid capsule pattern minimizes background noise with a bubble-like capture area. This is the same sort of sound pattern used in broadcast and recording studios and is the optimal solution for accurate and impactful vocals. The Alias comes in two variants. There's the Alias, which feeds your PC sound via USB, as well as the the Alias Pro, which connects via XLR, and it has a dedicated audio controller that not only acts as a preamp providing 48 volt phantom power, but it also supports dual PC setups. This is the first product of its type to do that sort of thing, allowing you to feed audio to two PCs at once if you are running a dual PC streaming setup. Whichever version of the mic you get, you're going to be getting access to Sonar, SteelSeries' very powerful software suite that allows you to customize this mic even further. For example, Sonar supports audio routing channels, meaning you can send your voice audio to one channel, your game audio to another, your music to another, and your system sound somewhere else again. This allows you to independently control the volume of each, and you can determine which channels get streamed or recorded. I use this feature all the time when I'm recording gameplay because I don't want Discord chatter to get picked up when I'm recording game sounds. Sonar also supports advanced audio features like a compressor, a noise gate, and AI noise cancelling, which means that background noise is filtered out and only your voice is captured. Sure, that means things like keyboard clicks or background chatter, but it could also mean other things. We're here at the Chicago Air and Water Show testing out sonar and AI noise cancellation feature. We're just testing it off and on. So if it could cancel out this noise, I imagine we'll be able to cancel out, um, you know, an air conditioner or a fan in your background or someone talking in your background. Like if it can do this, imagine what it can do for you. Taking a step back, what a package like the Alias Pro gives you is a studio quality mic with a stand and a shock absorber, a powered preamp, and a very flexible and powerful software suite that will allow you to customize both your setup and your sound quality. I really encourage you to go and look for how much it would cost you to get all of those things separately. And what you will find is that the Alias Pro is extremely competitively priced, especially for the quality you're getting. But I've got good news for you. You can get it even more competitively priced thanks to SteelSeries hooking up the channel with a discount. If you go to SteelSeries.com and use offer code SKILLUP at checkout, you'll get a full 12% off your purchase, no strings attached. That works for any product on the SteelSeries store, by the way, from headphones to keyboards to mice and more. They just launched literally last week and they will absolutely sell out. So if you want to grab one before they do, head over to SteelSeries.com and use offer code SKILLUP for 12% off your purchase. Thanks SteelSeries for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.